I, I, I'm sorry. I get. I, I'm not. I'm not funny. The thing I dread most. Hi. Thank you very much for having me. Um, uh, boy, this is like the least funny talk in history, too. Is <laughs> I'm. Um, so I had a lot of. A lot of. I have to say, I had. I was. I actually rewrote it. 5 a.m. this morning, yet again. I, every day I wake up and I rewrite this talk. So this is this morning's rewriting of the, of the talk. Um, and the title sort of makes sense for the talk. It's also the title of a book I just turned in, so it's sort of by my mind, which um, uh, part of what I want to talk with you about is what's happening with knowledge. And um, so that's an appropriate title. But the more um, distinct title is this, because what I really want to talk with you about is um, why the changes that are happening that we all know about are happening so quickly. So if you look at any, any page, you know, just at random, and then you peel it back and you look underneath it, you see the code, and in the code you'll see lots of these links, and it's a little, little tiny bit of technology. I mean, there's a worldwide system that supports this little bit of technology. Nevertheless, this was, you know, Tim Berners-Lee sitting by himself casually putting together a system, exactly this system that worked for him, you know, this one engineer. It's, this is a very, very simple little thing, this, this hyperlink. And yet, this really simple little thing is causing some of the most, uh, the firmest, most robust, most important uh, institutions in our culture just dissolve just fall apart. So an Encycl Encyclopedia Britannica is a cultural icon. You know, this is the, it's the Britannica. And it's, it's 65,000 articles are now just being dispersed. I mean, Britannica is still there, but Wikipedia is 3.5 million articles that are loosely connected. They're not even alphabetized because that wouldn't make any sense. You don't even know what sense it would make to talk about alphabetizing an online source like that. So Encyclopedia is just boom. Little little snippet of code that big, and, and we lose encyclopedias, at least from their cultural position. Uh, they, they, they disperse, I think quite usefully, they disperse. Newspapers become disaggregated and re-aggregated multiply around the net. They lose their, their coherence. And we shouldn't, especially in Nashville, shouldn't even talk about what's happened to notion of, of musical albums, a term that's no longer in, in currency, is it's just they dissolved. They dispersed, all because of this, it turned into playlists, you know, into millions and millions of separate playlists, because of a little tiny link. And so the question that I want to raise this morning is, why did these fundamental ways of making sense of our world just turn out to be so fragile? Just ping, they, they fell apart. We thought that these were the mainstays of culture, and ping, they, they just shattered. Why? So I want to look at three, three of those institutions or uh, institution's not the right word, but I, I don't know what the right word is. So, so I want to look at what's happening, uh, what has happened to sorting and ordering, um, long form writing, and then knowledge. So that's, that's a lot to cover in this period of time. So I, my strategy has been to do it really, really badly. So sorting and ordering. Um, this has been undergoing a major change. This is something we've also been very, very good at. We know how to do this. We, we've learned. We're, we're specialists. We, um, and it's not just about putting bugs in drawers. It's obviously, it's way, way more than that. This has a, goes back all the way into our, our Western history, because I'm only talking about Western stuff. So that's all I know anything about. Uh, so you know, just with Aristotle, you can go back further than that if you want. But for Aristotle and ever since, knowing how to classify and organize how things relate to uh, other things, what category you put things in. This has not been simply about putting bugs in drawers, but it's been about understanding our world. To know what something is has been to know where to put it in the conceptual uh, scheme. Um, and the, the thought that there might not be a single right order has been for thousands of years literally unthinkable. It was nonsense. It was nonsense to think that there might not be a single right order. Everything would be lost if that were the case. It's a foundational. So we had, we, we spent decades arguing in the 1900s about whether this thing gets classified as a, as a mammal or whether it's even impossible to exist because it breaks the, the laws of classifying. 
we have in the 21st century the world's silliest argument about whether this thing here is uh, a planet or not, or it is or it's not. Why, why the, we spend time on this is actually difficult to fathom, the question of whether Pluto is a planet. Nothing, nothing in the world changes, uh, based, and yet we've taken this very seriously. At least some of us, some of us did. The Astronomical Union did. <laughs> it's all the fault of atoms, um, because physical things have to go somewhere. You have to put them somewhere. You, have to, you just have to. They always have to be in some place. And they cannot be, two things cannot be in the same place at the same time. It's just how it works. They can't be in the same place at the same time. No matter how hard you try, you just can't do it. And so everything has to go someplace, and that everything can only go one place, only one place, you know what I mean. So we have to, we have to or you get the books into your library, you've got to put them somewhere, or your bookstore, or your home, or your, whatever it is you're, you're trying, you've got to put it somewhere. And so you have to come up with a scheme that makes sense for doing so. And so at one point in our history, this is how this fellow came up with the scheme and uh, famously sort of eccentric, uh, more than eccentric, pretty crazy sort of scheme the more you look at it. Um, so, you know, 10 categories of, of thought, of, of, of knowledge, each with 100 slots. And so if you're Melville Dewey, and you're a 21-year-old punk who's never traveled far beyond a tiny town in the upper New York State, you try to make sense of the world. And uh, your, your religion category, about 90% of them are explicitly Christian categories. And so you know, um, getting an integer, integer counts, it's a sign of significance. And on this Hanukkah, I'm happy to say that we Jews, we got our own, 296, of course. And, uh, Islam got its own, although it's now, you know, it's mixed with other religions, and uh, Zoroastrianism gets its own, and Buddhism, not so much. Buddhism lost in the Dewey lottery. It's a sub-number, didn't even merit its own decimal. And you know the Dewey system is just filled with things like this. Phrenology, you know, phrenology, the, the shape of the, the lumps on the head determine, indicate personality. That has its own number. There's a whole bunch of parapsychology numbers in, in, in Dewey. It's, it's sexist. It's, you know, it, it reflects his time and his personality and who he is. And his, it, you know. um, fine, so let's fix it. And so you send out you know, the librarians. And how many of you are librarians or, or close enough that you raise your hand? OK, so that's uh, say two thirds of you. Um, so we're going to send you out to the stacks, and you'll scrape off the white numbers on the spines, or maybe use those to cut out the RFID tags or whatever he's going to do. And you're going to get Dewey right. You're going to get rid of the embarrassments, and you're going to redo it. And so why haven't you done that? Well, uh, first of all, you're probably not using Dewey. Second of all, um, because you don't want to violate the OCLC's uh, copyright on it. And uh, finally, because you know that if you did it, uh, you, you could get rid of some of the embarrassments, but you would still be left with problems to which there is no solution, such as, OK, well, we, we're going to give Buddhists their own religion number. Uh, what are you going to do for the Scientologists? Anybody here, are they going to get their own religion number or not? Are they going to you know, make that decision? And then deal with all the gender issues and uh, deal with the Baha'is who view themselves, of course, as being a legitimate religion, but apparently um, some Muslims consider them to be sort of the Scientologies of, of Islam. Figure it out. There is no right answer. There is no right, right way to categorize because we don't agree. We just don't, you know, we look at the world differently. And so there isn't a single way of doing it. And of course, yeah, this is exactly the same problem. This is not just a library problem. This is a problem everywhere where atoms impinge upon information. So newspapers, what's going to go on the front page? Something has to, not going to leave it blank. You only have one front page because that's how atoms and work and how paper folds. So you're going to have to figure out what goes on the front page, which is going to be accorded, is going to be more visible. And so editors are going to have to make choices about this. And they make good choices, but you cannot find anybody who will agree that this should be their front page, except for the editorial board that decided on it. We all have our, we all skip something on the front page. We all think something else should be on the front page. It's the way that it works. That's why our own aggregators, when we re-aggregate, or our pathways through the news as we browse the web, they're all different. There isn't a right way of doing this. The, the problem is that the challenge that cannot be met is that uh, atoms force us to agree on things when, in fact, we don't. 
So I think it's useful as a framing for this to think about this in terms of there being three orders of order. In the first order, uh, this is the Bettman archives, 11 million photographs, 230 feet below ground in an old limestone quarry to preserve them, of course. Um, so first order, you take the physical things and you, you put them into folders. You do the best you can. You, know, you organize them using one order of uh, one sorting order. In the second order of of organization, of order itself, we separate the metadata from the data, you know, the information about the information. We separate the metadata from the data, and um, thus we get some tremendous benefits. Right? And so this is the front room of that very same Bettman archive. Um, so now we can get two or three or maybe four different ways of organizing. We get author, subject, uh, title, in, in, you know, if it were a library. Uh, which is wonderful, and it's much easier to navigate. We can run through these much faster than we, we can run through the, I think it's 530 miles of this in, in the Library of Congress of shelves. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, but we do pay a tremendous price for this benefit that we've gotten. I mean, clearly this is the right thing to do in, in the world as it has existed. But the price that we pay is that we, in order to achieve these benefits, we have to reduce the richness of a book to what fits on a three by five card. We just throw away the rest of the information that's there and we preserve some very, very useful information. But it's a hugely reductive technique that works extremely well but has a price. So those are the first two orders, which are the ones we've been operating in, but now we're digitizing everything. Um, and so there is that third order in which both the data and the metadata are digital. And this allows us to break free of the old tyranny of atoms, the old physics that was imposed upon us by uh, the nature of atoms in the real world. So um, I am assuming that everybody here is familiar with this sort of thing, so I'm going to be extremely brief about you know, a couple of techniques just as an example. Um, so for example, we get to, rather than simply having the information boiled down by somebody else, a professional who does an excellent job at it, nevertheless, that person cannot ever know I cannot know all the different ways this book might be interesting to me, how I might want to categorize it, why I bought it. And so now we get to do that ourselves. We tag it in social tagging. And each tag is like a bookshelf. It's a category. We can lump together all the books about colonialism, or this was written by my uncle, and lump together all my uncle's books. And we can do it dynamically, uh, dy dynamic, um, automatically assembling shelves. And so metadata in the third order, because it's all electronic, we can use all those techniques. And I, I'm actually not going to go through, I, I don't plan on going through any more of these. You know these, uh, all the different sorts of techniques better than I do. I just want to point out the extent to which we have been quite happy with piling on. We used to have you know, basically two ways of getting a book out of the library, which was to look it up in the card catalog or ask a librarian. Uh, now you go to Amazon, and Amazon just has so many different ways of, of navigating and finding. They're, they're, they strew them about um, in a way that in the past we would have said, well, no, it will confuse our users. They won't know what to do. And at Amazon, which is ruthlessly motivated by commercial interests, as its censoring of WikiLeaks shows us, uh, has been you know, very happy. Throw as much of this at the user as you can think of. They also do a lot of testing. So apparently, a lot of this stuff actually works. Drive for them works means enables people to find other books, find more books to buy. Um, User-generated stuff, not just top-down categories uh, that others have uh, decided would, would be useful. This is one of my favorites. You know statistically improbable phrases? So they do a, a text analysis of the corpus of the book, in this case, uh, Moby Dick, and they find phrases that are improbable within that book um, that are also used in other books. So for example, one of these SIPs is pagan harpooners. So if you have a particular interest in books about pagan harpooners, and this is going to drive you to buy more from Amazon, you click on that, you'll see all the books that use this phrase. This is a completely weird way of sorting through a gigantic collection of, of books for sale. But apparently, it moves a few more books, so it's there. So Amazon will sh gives us so many different ways of sorting that you could, you could spend most of an afternoon going through a single book page, all on the same page. And they sell a lot of books. So a lot of metadata, a lot of freedom to sort, 
the idea that there is a single right way of ordering is, from Amazon's point of view or from the web's point of view is ridiculous. We want as much metadata as possible so that we can figure out together how to sort things and sort them differently. But this means also that metadata has changed dramatically in once it has become digital. Uh, so we're all very comfortable with metadata, the difference between sort of the tag and, and the thing. Um, a nice distinction between, and those coming out of an information science background, computer uh, science background, are also very, very familiar with the difference between the, the data and the metadata that sort of tags the, uh, tag the, the, the rows and the columns so you can find it. Um, you have to design the metadata ahead of time, figure out what fields you want in your database and put them in, get that right. Very, it's a very old distinction, which has been re-emphasized in the initial movement uh, into the world of computers, the world of, of digitized information, right? databases that have data and metadata attached to them. Once we get into the third order, which is the networked world, metadata changes. So uh, this is a very common thing that uh, you remember a little bit of what uh, is metadata, you know, your subject, author, title. You remember the author's name. You can't remember the book. So you search these days in the third order, and you get back the title of the book. You'll also get back the book. Or you'll get back snippets of the book. Or you'll get back, if it's copyrighted, or you'll get back a big, this is copyrighted, you pirate. How dare you sort of notice. But you'll get back something. You'll at least get back the title. If the corpus is available, you get back the text itself. Which means that since this text is available, it's been indexed, which means that you can now also take any, any bit of the text say the first line and say, you know, what was that book that had that phrase, call me Ishmael, and I can't quite remember. It might have been the first line even. Search on that, you'll get back the author. Right? Which means that the old line between data and metadata is gone. That metadata now is not what somebody figured out ahead of time is the right set of categories. Metadata is simply the thing that you know, and data is what you're looking for. And that changes. Right? So you can use any piece. Uh, if, if you know the author, that's metadata. If you know a bit of the content, that's metadata. There is no difference between metadata and data except a functional one. What you know and what you're looking for. So when you do this search, you'll get back the author and the book. You'll also get back, well, you know, you'll get back uh, everything. You'll get back uh, the author's bibliography and biography and uh, the his, the picture of his house in Pittsfield and the map to his house in Pittsfield, and you'll get back his social network, there's Hawthorne and Hawthorne's house, and the story about how they climbed the hill, Monument Mountain, and had a picnic, and wonder what they talked about. And you'll get back stuff about whales, their biology, you'll get back information about their ecology, you'll get back Al Gore, you'll get back everything. It will all come back to you. Because, and this is actually a phenomenal thing, I think, as we all know, because if, there, if the difference between metadata and data is simply what you know and what you don't know, that means that everything now can function as metadata for finding something else, which is really, generally, really good news for us because we use metadata to pry up what we don't know. It makes us smarter. And if everything is metadata, we, everything's a crowbar now, and ev uh, we just got much, much smarter. So metadata is not what it used to be, right? It's very, very different. It's very far removed from our prior ideas about how we sought and order, sort, excuse me, sort and order the world. It's massive, it's bottom up, it's messy, it's self inconsistent, right? Tags famously make mistakes, they get things wrong, they have misspellings and they disagree with one another. So what? You know, it worked for one person, worked for another, get enough of them together, you can sort through it and make some sense of it. Um, and it's out of control. Well, you can't predict, you can't control, you can't stop. This, is, this would have shocked Aristotle, this notion that there isn't a single right way of ordering. So how did this massive shattering at the drop of a hyperlink, how did this happen? Well, it's because the old system didn't scale. It looked like it scaled because we were only dealing with 11 million photos at the Bettman. You know, it looked like a lot at one point. It's a very big room, very expensive to operate. But it's nothing, 11 million photos? My friend Doc Searles has probably taken 11 million photos and posted them at, at Flickr. Nothing. It turns out it doesn't scale. And it forced us to make decisions where we didn't have to. And so we had to, we had to go wrong. We had to decide this is really about this and not really about that. Well, you know, 
these are unreal choices. This is what goes on the front page. This, isn't, this is not news. Well, OK, maybe. That's how you see it. And it imposed values. You see this very clearly in, in Dewey's crazy, well, you know, 19th century small town values, which now seem offensive and crazy. You can see this in the way newspaper, every time you disagree with what's on the front page of a newspaper. So that's why it was ready to shatter. OK, so that's the easy case, because in, in that, that type of ordering, um, the ordering is fairly extrinsic. Now, Aristotle would have said it's not extrinsic at all. It's actually determinative of what the essence of the thing is. When you're shelving a book, you're not, you don't have a sense that you're determining an Aristotelian essence for it. You know, you're making it easy to find and trying to bring some sense and order to it. So that, that's sort of the easy case of ordering. Long form writing is a much harder case. That is, you know, a book length argument. Because in a long form book, the order is really important. It's, it's essential to it. Um, and yet we're seeing long form writing not go away, but no longer, I, I believe, it is rapidly descending at, from, its, from being the pinnacle of human thought and intellectualism and understanding of the world. You write the book, and you get it right, and you put it out on the back table available for sale with the author ready to sign it at a very reasonable price, by the way. That sort of enthroning of long form writing, I think uh, many of us recognize, although many of us hate it. I do not, uh, sorry. Many of us recognize that it is being dethroned. Many of us hate that. I do not, actually. I'm actually pretty happy about it. So it will still be with us, just not at the pinnacle. So um, at sort of the, the um, boil down essence of long form writing, uh, this is the paradigm of how it works an argument. If A and B are true, then C is true. Long, and it moves you along from boom, boom, oh yeah, got there. Now the next argument, boom, boom, boom. And you do this all the way through. You go from A all the way to your intended Z, and you've established Z. And if you do this deductively, you've established it with a certainty that not even God could deny. If you do it the way that most books are written, very few are written deductively, Spinoza's ethics. Uh, if you do it in the more usual way by evincing evidence, then you've established, as by the weight of preponderance of the evidence, you've brought your reader to accept Z. And so you're bringing the, the reader along this path of argument, which is great, but I want to uh, talk briefly about three problems with this, why this is being dethroned. And I want to take as my example one of the great, great, and I think very successful works of long form argument, which is uh, Origin of Species a work that is um, a literary masterpiece as well as a scientific one. So table of contents, um, this is the first problem, right? If you look at the table of contents of Origin of Species, the argument is actually in the first uh, five chapters, one through five. And then uh, six through 11 are repl Darwin replying to objections to one through five, and then some additional evidence in the concluding chapter. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, well, OK, fine, except that those chapters, 6 through 11, they read fine now. They're, Darwin is confronting um, his, the scientific community's objections to his ideas um, and his anticipated, the anticipated objections. And so we have no problem. We're modern readers. We read this and understand that. It's what we expect. But he has spent six chapters arguing with the voices inside his head. He's figuring out. He's anticipating. This is what people will say. And of course, it's reason we want him to do that. But increasingly, that's going to look like a fugue state. Why is Darwin hallucinating his objectors, his critics? It's because that's all he can do. It's a book. Books are closed. They're written on pages. There's no room for the reader except to read. There's no interaction, but that's crazy talk. I mean, literally crazy talk for a printed book. So in sitting in his silence, he hallucinates readers. He does it very effectively and responds to them. It's a, re it's a reasonable thing to do. It's also um, a type of book-induced psychosis. Second problem with long-form argument is that uh, you're trying to get to Z. You're, try, you're sticking to a path. And you don't want to be distracted by side trips that might confuse or distract the reader. And so you pare things down. So the, 
you know, all the interesting sites around? No, 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 no. I, I'm writing this book. You're reading it. I'm going to tell you. You're going to stay on the bus. You stay on the bus because I know where I'm going. I'm trying to get you to Z. We don't have time to go off to subprime one and to, you know, Alpha Centauri. We're trying to get, I'm going to get you to Z. Shh, I'm going to get you to Z. One of the problems with long form writing is that it, in fact, isn't long enough. It's not discursive enough. It also frequently tends to overfocus the author, and I say this as, as an author. Um, we often tend to get so fixed in getting to Z that we throw out. We will do everything we can to dissuade you from getting off the bus. So it's at, long form writing is actually too narrow. It's a march when it might be a visit. Third problem is that even with a great book, like uh, Critique of Pure Reason. Oh, I pressed too soon. There we go. OK. It's very few of them make it to Z. The book makes it to Z. Pardon me. The reader rarely makes it to Z. Most readers get off in long form books at B or C. And you read all the way to the Critique of Pure Reason, and you say, well, no, OK, this is an important book historically, and the guy's brilliant, but I, I, I lo he lost me a long time ago with his four part divisions and three. I got his overall point, but Man, by the time you get to Z, you're, you're overwhelmed with things you don't believe. Very few books actually successfully get you to Z. Darwin is one. The Origin of Species is one. Um, uh, Animal Liberation by Peter Singer was very influential in my life. It got me all the way to Z. I've been at Z for 30 years. That worked. Hard to find examples of books that you've read, long form, that got you all the way well, you may, I'm, you'll read the entire book. That's not the point. The point is, are you still believing what the author says? It's, I find very hard to find instances of that. So um, if long form thought is under challenge, let's say, in a, in a um, shattered world of the web, with lots of little pieces, lots of distraction, lots of, it's not A to Z, it's wherever you want to go, it's the map. Uh, what's the alternative? Well, it's not short-term thought. It's more like web form thought, uh, which is to say hyperlink thought. That's the characteristic of the web. And we are now learning, we are figuring out, successfully, unsuccessfully, lots of experiments, uh, how to think in a webbed, hyperlinked way. It's quite unfamiliar to us. For one thing, the voices that were in Darwin's head, head objecting, they're not in the author's head anymore. They're leaving posts on her blog. They're you know, writing about it and linking. They're tweeting, whatever. So long form thought is proving to be fragile, more fragile than we thought. Little hyperlink, ping, and it's beginning to fall apart. Long form thought, this is the pinnacle of human thinking. Why? Well, because it, it induces, a, it, it encourages a type of artificial focus. Too, too tightly focused on getting to Z. It requires a disconnected dialogue. You are engaged in anticipation with what your readers will say once the book is published. And it may be the fact that so few books make it from A to Z, um, bring the reader along all the way to Z, may indicate there's something not right with even the ideal of long form thought. Maybe. Our world is not actually all that conducive. Maybe it actually isn't structured in the form of long form arguments. Maybe it's not like that at all. Third thing that gets shattered is knowledge. So we used to think that, there, that knowledge was about building up a single correct true picture of the world. And we would do this through facts. Facts are a very recent invention, by the way. It's like 19th century. Um, but we would do it by piecing things together. Um, and uh, we would end up with a single agreed upon picture of the world, right? representation of the world. We're going to write the book of nature. Well, we're going to read the book of nature, and then we're going to transcribe it into our own book. But nevertheless, a picture of the world. As we have been doing this, we've known all, all along, along that our skulls are just too small. The world is way, way, has always been too big to know. We've, we've known that. And so we developed some extremely effective tra uh, strategies. I almost said tragedies, which is just a Freudian error. Uh, the main one of which is to break the world into brain-sized bits. Big enough, just big enough for a human being to master, to, have, to be an expert in. 
and that person then be masters that that bit of the, uh, that bit of the world, that little domain. And then we call upon these experts. This is where the payoff is, right? We, we can call upon them. We have a question. We can ask the, e the expert, and we can get an answer. And the most important thing is that we then can stop asking. You ask the, the chemistry professor, what is the atomic, or you look it up in the book, what is the atomic weight of magnesium? You do not have to then go into your backyard and do the science experiment to confirm. You got your answer. This is a very efficient strategy for dealing with a world that is too big to know. And this is why we are the dominant species on our planet, because this worked so well. So I, I'm not arguing against it, but we have, there's a change going on. So we've had the system of knowledge that is based around stopping points, providing stopping points for inquiry, because that's efficient. If there's a credentialing system, that's also a stopping point. So you have authorities who, who can uh, answer questions, stopping in inquiry. We want to know which authorities to uh, believe. We have a credentialing system that also is a stopping point for inquiry. Oh, you got your degree from whatever, therefore, right? Very efficient. But we've thought that that's how knowledge works, that that is the structure of knowledge. And it's not. It's really just the structure of the medium of knowledge, which has been paper and books and libraries. The strategy of knowledge, the most basic strategy of knowing our world that we've had, is based upon the limitations of paper. Books are, an ex they are a disconnected medium. They're actually quite awful for knowledge. It's the best we've had. We've done the best any species could do with them, but they are actually a disaster for knowledge. They require breaking topics up into, into uh, sizes that fit between covers. They require, because they are so disconnected, uh, getting everything into b between covers. This is how we ended up with long form thought, by the way. You have to you get, you can't get from A to C in the book. You got to get to Z, but, or unless you're going to do a series of volumes. But you have to get it between covers. You publish them, you think and do the work of thinking, beforehand, and then you publish and throw them out into the world. That's perverse. It's the best we could do, but it's a perverse idea of knowledge that you will think in private and then publish, and the world can see. That the world will consist of thinkers and writers and readers. It is a perverse way of doing knowledge, the best that we could do. Books are a profoundly disconnected medium. And so we've taken this limitation, and we've turned it into a virtue. So oh, this is how knowledge works. It's divided up into topics, and there are people who think they're experts, and there are people who think about these things, and they are experts, and they provide it. That's how books work. That's the limitation. It is not the virtue of knowledge. The problem is that skulls don't scale, and libraries don't scale. The largest libraries are not nearly big enough. We know this because we know the size of the largest libraries, and we know how quickly and how many thousands of years it took to generate that, and we know the size of the internet and how many minutes it took to generate that in our spare time with our cognitive surplus, if I may quote Clay Shirky for the first time, there will be a second time. So library, uh, skulls don't scale, libraries don't scale, networks scale. It's the only thing that, that we have that scales. It's the network. As far as we know, it scales as far as we want it to. So let's talk about scale for a moment. So I want to go back to um, the idea before the network, which was information overload. Um, this is a term that first instance of it was in, in the early 60s, but it really became popularized uh, by Alvin Toffler in 1970. And this is his very, very good bestseller, Future Shock. So it holds up surprisingly well in this book. And in it, he is the one who really put forward the, uh, into the public this idea of information overload, which he ties correctly back to the previous term, which was sensory overload. And sensory overload, 1950, the idea was, as you know, that you could be in a place, say a Grateful Dead concert, where there's so much noise, uh, music, sounds, smells, touch, that your sensory system gets so overloaded that you fall down as a gibbering idiot. You, literally, that you will have a personal psychological breakdown because of this, and they have to have cold compresses and, uh, and, and you know, to cool off. So sensory overload, Toffler says, uh, OK, that's, yeah, that's clear. We have that. Suppose now we have this thing called, now that we have so much information, that we have information overload. 
it would be the same sort of thing. He says, in fact, that sanity hinges upon avoiding information overload. It's, an individu it's something that attacks the individual the way sensory overload does. That was the idea. Uh, okay, so that's 1970. In 19, and the idea hits the, the culture, and um, some work begins to be done on it. And in 1974, uh, a marketing study was done. So what does information overload look like in 1974? Uh, so uh, some marketers were looking at this. They did a test. They took 192 housewives. Notice the air quotes, 192 housewives. They gave them 16 brands. And each of those brands had 16 different uh, types of information on it. And those 16 types of information weren't even, they, they were also simplified. So the calories wasn't the actual calorie count. It was simply low or high calories. And what the study discovered was that if you give 192 housewives 16 products with 16 categories, they suffer information overload. That was information overload. We laugh in the face of this type of information. Are you kidding me? This is information overload? That's what they were worried about? 16 brands, 16 categories, 192 housewives? It's ridiculous. It has Nevertheless, this was such a serious problem that the marketers used this study to justify withholding information. You don't want to give them that much information because it actually will decrease the ability of housewives to make uh, good decisions. That was information overload. Well, it has gone from being an individual syndrome like uh, gibbering idiot sensory overload to becoming, uh, not only is there much more than, than the 16 brands, but it's become a cultural phenomenon, not an individual psychological syndrome. And in general, when you hear people referring to information overload, what they're saying is, I'm not getting enough information, or I'm not getting the right information. It's not, this, it's not the Toffler idea at all. We've gotten so acclimated to the vast amounts of information all around us that we, it's, it's no longer the same problem that we thought it was in 1970. And here's the second Clay Shirky reference. I am a huge, huge fan of Clay Shirky. Uh, he says, there's no such thing as information overload, only filter failure. Exactly right. There's a little more to say, uh, which is that, and also, our filters have changed. The nature of our filters have changed. So it used to be that when you were in the physical world, the first and second orders, if you will, that when you filtered stuff, the people you were filtering for didn't see what you didn't let through. So if you're a publisher, readers don't get to see the vast number of manuscripts that come through over your transom that you just don't do anything with. And if you are in collections, uh, people don't see trucks full of the books that you didn't get backing away from the library. All they see is this nice manageable building, beautifully laid out and thought through. And so knowledge looks way more manageable than it in fact is because the filtering was invisible. It was filtering out. In the digital world, we don't filter out. We include everything. Everything's still there. And to filter something on the web, means simply to reduce the number of clicks that it takes to get there. So I'm going to filter for you. I'm going to give you my top 10, since I'm on a Peter Singer animal liberation kick, I guess, my top 10 vegan recipes. I'm put on my blog, from drawn from around the web. Here's my filter. It's a playlist, basically, right? So here's my filter. All I've done is reduce the number of clicks it would take you to get to those recipes. And the, 10 that, the, the million that are not on my list, they're still there. You'll still find them if you want. You go to Google or some, some other blogger is going to link to them or somebody's going to send you an email or a message or they're going to Facebook or whatever. You, you'll, they're still there. They can still be found. And furthermore, the techniques you use for finding stuff constantly throw in your face exactly how much stuff you're not looking at. You do a search for something on Google, 90 million hits. You're never going to get to the bottom of that list, but it tells you right there at the top line how many things you're not seeing. We're not filtering out, we're filtering forward. We're bringing things forward, but everything still remains there. So we now know how much there is that we don't know. We, we see the vastness of it. This is not simply an abundance, however, it, it's a connected abundance. It's linked. All those people, that's how you get onto the net in the first place, onto the web. You get linked. And you can think about these links as a new type of punctuation. The old types of punctuation generally tell you where to stop. The new type of punctuation tells you how to continue, unless you continue just by magically clicking on a little blue underlined text. And this creates a web. It's a create, it creates a web, however, that is a web of difference. So much of 
the history of knowledge has been about driving out difference, driving out disagreement, settling issues. You go to the, you have a question, you have a debate, you go to the expert, you get the answer, you look it up. Knowledge has been that about which disagreement has been banished. We have settled the matter. That's what we know, the stuff that we settle. And so that's part of the stopping point system of knowledge, that it settles knowledge. It drives out disagreement. The web only works because it contains, contains so much difference and so much disagreement. When you link to something, you link, link to a site that is, un, that is different than yours. Often it's because you agree, sometimes it's because you disagree, or you think it's funny, or all the different ways, all the different semantic relationships that there are get expressed. But in every case, a link is a link to something different. And this web is a web of, of difference. And this results in the unsettling of knowledge. And I want to point to three ways that happens. The first has to do with the brain-sized chunks. So if you look up uh, philosophy in Brit Britannica and Wikipedia, in Britannica you'll find 180,000 contiguous words in the Macropedia, A to Z, 180,000 words. Wikipedia, they're A to Z, 9,000 words. And that's long for a Wikipedia article. Right? Wikipedia likes them to be 6,000 words maximum. Last time I looked, 9,000. And so Britannica wins 20 times the amount on philosophy. But of course, I have forgotten something really important in this calculation, which are Links, exactly, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of links in those 9,000 words. So if you want to do a head-to-head, apples-to-apples comparison, you're going to have to decide which of the other articles in Wikipedia, totally different strategy, of course, uh, from Britannica, which of those are about philosophy. And so you're going to go through, right? And you want to do this word count. And so some of the links clearly are going to be about Hellenistic philosophy. Yes, that gets added to the word count. And Thomas Aquinas, absolutely, mainstream Western philosopher, he gets added. And reason, oh yeah, added to the philosophy count. And faith, well, I'm not sure. Philosophers have argued for 2,000 years about whether faith should count as a part of philosophy. If faith is the basis of truth, then, you know, it's got to be in philosophy if it's not. So this is an act you're going to have to decide. You want to do apples to apples? You're going to have to decide. Likewise, for the article on God, I mean, you're going to have to figure this out. There is no way to do the apples to apples because the, the architectures are so very, very different. And in fact, it would, I would argue that Wikipedia's architecture, its linked structure, very natural, you know, we all take it for granted, that this linked structure ends up being a better representation of the topic of knowledge than Britannica's A to Z, 180,000 contiguous, boom, done way. This is a much better representation of what the topic of knowledge is. It's loose-edged, it's arguable, it necessarily involves individual human judg judgment, and it's unsettled. We don't know what the topic of philosophy is. We only thought we did because we had bookshelves, we had books, we had encyclopedias that went A to Z between the covers, that's philosophy. As soon as we're able to link things together with these little links, the basic structure of these topics change, and it turns out that it's the world is not, knowledge is not structured the way that we thought it was back when we did this with books. The second way that it gets unsettled is when, is when it comes to authority, that knowledge gets unsettled. And it's obviously a huge topic and I'm going to be uh, really <laughs> superficial. Um, so we end up, we used to have a strong division between what gets published and what doesn't. Now it's so easy to publish that we have instead an ecology of knowledge or an ecology of authority. So this, the old authorities are still there. You know, nature still accepts very, very few articles that are sent to it and publishes those. And so you go to nature and you know this is not only good science, it's important science because that's all they publish. You go to the Public Library of Science 1, Public li Library of Science in general, and you can still be confident that it's good science because it is peer-reviewed, but Public li uh, PLOS 1 will publish anything that passes peer review, even if it's a little article, even if it's a re reproducing the results that somebody else did, or it's negative results, which don't get published. You know, all this that we tell ourselves about science being you know, negative results are as important as bull. We don't publish them. Now we do. And so you can go to uh, PLOS One and uh, many other places, and you can actually see good science that was too small to make it through the old filters, the old binary filters. Or you can go to archive.org, which, as you know, is a site where it's a, anybody with any 
uh, standing can post a paper at any stage of development, including first draft, speculative, and the like. You go there and you know from the metadata that that's the, that's the quality of the information. And so it's fine. As long as you know that this is a first draft, it's, it's perfectly fine, or this, this is rough first results. And it may be that the rough first results, the data table that's published there, under metadata that tells you, don't rely on these too much, may still give another scientist the, the hint that she needs in order to cure cancer two years earlier than it would have taken if the, the results were published in Nature or some other official magazine. So metadata sets us free and enables an ecology of knowledge, not simply binary, but at it, it, all the different levels of sophistication and certainty that we can, we can use. As long as the metadata is clear, it all works. So that's the second way it gets unsettled. And the third is going to be, I, I'm least happy about telling you, <coughs> presenting to you. Um, it's un, the new type of knowledge, the linked knowledge, is unsettling because we really, really want to believe. We love this quote from Senator Moynihan. Um, Everyone is entitled to his own opinion, not his own facts. This has been getting more and more currency. Um, and you can see why, especially in a time of, of knowledge turmoil like we're in. It's so, yeah, OK. Uh, OK, but what we actually hear in this lofty statement is something, I think, a little uh, crasser, which is, you know, there is one right answer. We have it. We can, we can crush you against our facts. Facts are a bedrock. We can use it. We can slam you down. We can win. Because there's one set of facts that are right. And you are not entitled. You are not entitled to disagree with me, because I got the facts. That's what we hear in this. Well, this is a complex matter. I believe in facts, I believe in reality, I believe in science, I really, really do. And I get very upset at, I believe in this stuff. Nevertheless, we've had this dream in our culture since the Enlightenment that if you get reasonable people together who may disagree and you sit them down at a coffee, preferably a coffee house, you know, sort of a paradigm here, and you let them speak long enough, they will come to agreement. They will learn. They will sift through. They'll, it's an architectural metaphor. So they'll, they'll sort of dig down, archaeological, and get to the bedrock. And they'll build on that. And, no, we won't. We now know. We have empirical evidence. We're not going to do that. We don't agree. We've had thousands of years to thrash these things out, to engage in rational conversation, to do this very thing. And we don't agree. And science says, if you believe in learning from experience and looking at the world as it is, what you have to conclude is, we are not going to agree. That program, that enlightenment program, does not work. Maybe it should. Maybe Moynihan is right and it should work, but it doesn't. It's not going to. And I would suggest to you that it's never worked for you either. That you've never sat, sat down with a Nazi or a racist and had a casual, uh, had a calm, long conversation in which you changed your mind or were open to changing your mind. So, sure, facts are important, blah, blah, blah. It doesn't work. We know this. An elementary realism says, as a practical matter, that dream is over. By the way, this quote from Senator Moynihan. It's unattributed. He may not have said it. There's no way of finding out. So we shouldn't despair entirely um, if we look at, because what's happening is that knowledge is moving to the network level. So it's a mistake to look at any particular knower or work of knowledge and, and, um, and judge it on the basis of, of that. It's knowledge is moving from being contained in books and in skulls to being contained at the network level where it has the properties, just as knowledge took on the properties of books and of, being, of paper, it's now taking on the properties of the network. It's never done. It's, it's being done in public. It's never finished. It's done, done in public. It's super abundant, beyond belief. It's wildly imperfect, and it is deeply, deeply unsettled and unsettling. At the network level, um, this actually works out pretty well. Because find a scientist, find an intellectual, an historian, anybody, a researcher who does not believe that this is the greatest time in history to be a researcher, somebody who cares about knowledge. It is the greatest time in history because of the network. Find one of those people who would give up network access, not just for a vacation or to focus on a book, but say, no, no, this is net negative. I'm smarter without it. Find me that person. You will not. 
I don't think. Of course, now you're going to find one, but I, I, I can't imagine who it is. Unfor so it's a great time to be a smart person. It's also a great time to be a really stupid person, because Annette does that for you also. And that is it's a real issue that we maybe should talk about. Net, the knowledge lives at the network level, taking on the properties of the net, and at its best, it is um, the greatest time in history ever to be thinking. And the political issue here, by the way, is, and we may lose it if we don't get our policies right. That's a different topic. So why did these three things, why were they so ready to fail? The shatter, you know, bing, the little hyperlink, bing, falls into dust and something new and good or bad, but something new emerges from it from, with ferocious power and, and, and velocity. Why were our old systems, these most basic things that we worked on for thousands of years that we got really right, that we knew how to do, how to classify, we knew how to, we, we knew how to write long form and reason through, and we knew how to, to know things, and we had newspapers, and why did this crumble? Why was it so fragile? And part of it is that I gave you the wrong metaphor. It didn't just get fragile and shatter. It's that it burst. These, these institutions burst free of old constraints. As soon as we remove the constraints that paper and, and atoms put on them, they burst. We spent a couple of thousand years trying to get onto the same, everybody onto the same page. Quite literally, in many cases, one right way of thinking about it, we get everybody on the page, the page is too small, the page is too expensive, the page can only be produced by a special class of people who have necessarily gain, even if they don't want it, they gain special power in our culture. The page is too small. And as soon as we had a means that was not bound to the rectangles of pages, the disconnected rectangles of books, as soon as we were able to connect, we allowed ourselves to recognize what we, what we suspected all, of, all our, our lives, all our, through our culture. Our understanding of the world is not bound in books. It's loose-edged and it's connective, and it's unfinishable, and it's deeply, deeply, inevitably fallible, just as we are, and thus it's unsettled. You know, I, I, we, this shattered so quickly, it burst so quickly, because I think we knew that it wasn't going to work. We always knew it wasn't going to work. We always knew the newspaper did not really reflect everybody's interest in the absolute truth about what's most important, and we knew this. But we had no other alternative, so we talked ourselves into believing that that was the best of all possible, and it was the best of all possible worlds, and all we had was paper and, and atoms. So our project of driving out difference went ahead, because that's all we could do. You had to drive out enough difference that you could get it all within a book, all within a, a, a newspaper. It's how it had to work. But our medium has changed, and so has our hope. In my view, this new hope is actually far more realistic than the old one, of getting everybody on the same page. And it's also more human. I think this is, uh, this is ultimately, it's the recognition of this is that made the old solid regimes so fragile, which is to say so ready to burst free of their old limitations in the face of a tiny, tiny hyperlink. Thank you. Um, how are we fixed on time? Oh, really? No. Hmm, I should have talked longer. <laughs> okay. So we do. Have, I'm very happy. We do have um, time for. Do, uh, may I take questions? I assume that's. <laughs> it would be ironic if I couldn't. <laughs> so. Um, yeah. You surely you don't agree with that. Yes. So I'm, 
Uh, that's a wonderful question. Um, do I need to repeat it? Uh, the question is, I sounded optimistic at the end, but it seems unwarranted from what I'd been saying, which is fairly pessimistic, especially since, and, and you'll obviously correct me if I'm getting this wrong, uh, when we are not on the same page, let's say, when we're in disconnected parts of the network, um, it breeds um, a polarity in which we accept uh, our own set of facts and become increasingly resistant to other facts which may actually be right. So we get more confirmed in our own beliefs, more polarized and more extreme. Um, and at least one of those groups, since they disagree, has to be wrong. Is that? OK. Um, so I, I actually recast your question a little bit in Cass Sunstein's terms. Cass Sunstein has been writing about this. Um, Sunstein is the most cited lawyer in history, I believe, and he's also um, uh, in the White House at the moment. Um, so first of all, I'm optimistic all the way through. I'm thrilled to see long-form argument be contextualized, let's say. Because as I say, there's, um, the web allows people to post extremely long arguments if that's what they want to do. And I'm a, I, an old school writer, and I write uh, long-form, argumenty sorts of things. I'm sort of not structured well enough, but it's something like that. <clears throat> so there's plenty of room for that, and that continues. The question is whether it's going to be the pinnacle of human experience, and, and, excuse me, human expression and human reason and human knowledge, which I think it will not continue to be. It will still be there. But that's not why I'm not optimistic because it will still be there. I'm optimistic about the hyperlink environment in which thought now occurs. Um, likewise for knowledge. Uh, I think we've been terribly constrained by basing knowledge upon a publishing model um, in which scholars work basically in private publish when done. That is, um, that is so, so limiting. So I'm very optimistic about that as well. I think it basically it's a good thing to be writing. The scholars these days, as many, most are, are publishing ideas early. They're trying them out on, let's say, blog posts or wherever else. They're getting reaction. They're arguing back and forth. They're having the actual arguments with actual critics and, and colleagues. Um, and upon the date of publication, if they do have a publication date, they continue to be engaged. They actually hear what readers are saying and can engage with readers. Uh, an example I use in, in uh, the book is Jay Rosen, uh, who um, the head of NYU's journalism, journalism program. He writes about journalism and, uh, and the changes. He's famous for writing long pieces on the web, which you know, I don't know, there may be 2,000 words. So that in, Outside the web, they're not particularly long, but he posts 2,000 words. It looks massive. Um, and then engages. He gets hundreds of comments. He's very lively in engaging with them. He's all over the web. And he's working, at, working out these ideas in public. I think that's fantastic. I would way, way, way rather have Jay Rosen working that way than getting, having him publish a column every two months and whatever. So I'm very enthusiastic about this way of knowing and thinking um, collaboratively. Um, I, the uh, threaded uh, topical nature of, I'll use, uh, of Wikipedia, but of course it's true for the entire web because it's all threaded and linked that way. I think it is a far, if you want to know what, if you're the proverbial alien and you want to know what humans think and how we put our world together, I would send you to Wikipedia in a nanosecond, as opposed to Britannica. So far better reflection of who we are, how we think, weaknesses and strengths as well. And I say this in the proximity, proximity of the Siegenthaler Institute, uh, which you know, may be the most famous case of Wikipedia vandalism. Uh, so I, I'm very, very uh, enthusiastic about all of these changes. Now, the one that you raise is the most troubling of them all, um, which I mentioned only in passing. It's a huge, huge issue, as you know, um, which is the polarization, the fact that we can, in this connected world, paradoxically, we can um, isolate ourselves um, and become stupider, cut ourselves off more, find a group of people who think just like us, ignore all the differences is at the heart of the good stuff that's happening with knowledge and the rest of it. Um, and we can, it's a great time to be stupid. And so this is, as I'm sure you know, this is a hugely complex question, um, in part because we, not only do we lack the data, we lack the concepts by which we could figure out what data we want. So it's extremely difficult to tell what's happening. Plus, which I'll talk about in a second, 
Plus, this is occurring in a, in a world that is not simply driven by the web. We have polarized news media, which we did not have 20 years ago. We have had at other points in our history, but now we have mass media that are intensely, intensely polarized. We have echo chambers that are on the air, quite consciously so. Um, maybe that's enabled by the web. Maybe it's enabling the web. Maybe it's independent of the web, but it's very hard to sort this stuff out. So the issues for sorting this out are, I believe, along the lines of figuring out whether this is actually happening. Um, is it, so do you look at the links and see, so you go to a left-wing site and you see how many links are going to right-wing sites, vice versa. That's been done. There's, you know, so uh, one, one of the studies, 15% of political sites link, 15% of the links on a political site link to opposition. I don't know whether that's a lot or a little. I, I don't know whether to say, yeah, 15%, that's great. Or to say, well, it should be 50%, shouldn't it? And if I say it should be 50% linked to opposition, what planet am I from? Politics has always been about finding this is how political action works. In fact, it's how conversation works, which makes this yet a more difficult problem. There's a model behind the, the internet is polarizing idea that I think is, is often quite explicitly a rationalist idea, excuse me, an enlightenment idea, that the only real and worthwhile conversations are ones in which two people who radically disagree dig down together in a spirit of, of common inquiry and discover the truth, each open to changing her mind. And we never had those conversations, A, as I, as I said, and B, it's not the role of conversation. Most of our conversations are not about changing minds. I had a lovely, really interesting breakfast conversation with, with six, seven people this morning. It was not about changing minds. It was basically we found things that we roughly agree upon, areas of common interest and the like, um, and then we iterate on it. That's how, that's how conversation works. And furthermore, most conversation isn't about, con it's not cognitive, it's about forming social bonds. At some point during the breakfast conversation, I said something slightly political. Um, and I very carefully uh, insulated it so nobody would take offense and we wouldn't go off down that because I want to stay on the track of you know, conversation requires massive amounts of agreement. It's like the 99% the of our genes are the same as in a chimpanzee. It's just that one percent. The same thing with conversation. 90, we have to agree about 99% of the stuff before we can have a conversation and iterate forward. So, I'm sorry, really long answer, but it's a, it's a crucial question. Um, a, I'm sure that it does happen to some degree, and it's regrettable. I hate seeing that. It's a great time to be stupid. I don't like my culture getting stupider, because I have to live with these people. That's A. B, it's extremely difficult to tell actually what's going on. We don't even know where to look or what to compare it to. And three, uh, C, am I doing numbers or letters? C, the the base model of it, which is not the one you're presenting, uh, by the way, which is that conversation should be always aiming at, and uh, I think is just a misreading, misunderstanding of what conversation does. So I don't know what's happening. I am very concerned about it. And so the, the D is, we should, in my opinion, we should act as if this is the most pressing real problem. So I don't want to wait to find out. It's just like global warming. Sorry, I'm getting political again. I don't want to wait to find out that this was a problem. We have to act now, and the way that we act now as educators is to try, do what educators do, which is to try to open students up to other points of view and to enable them to make connections at, at cognitive and emotional levels among people that they disagree with. Insight, I think, is what you're looking for. But go ahead, yeah. Uh, it is a critical, absolutely, it's a critical skill. Um, and critical thinking adopted, 
adapted to the uh, networked world, because right? critical thinking, right. um, so yes, that, that, that's the easy part of the answer, absolutely critical thinking. Um, I don't believe that there is a big difference between blogs and conversations as you do, because I consider them to be both, a blog is a slow conversation. It can be, uh, in a prototypical blog is. Um, so, and so I only have glib answers. I'm sorry, these are, you know, what is education? I don't know, if, what, what, what I want my children, who are now grown, but what I wanted from them to be educated is to find the world more interesting than the media were leading to believe it was. To be incredibly curious, to have the, the cognitive, navigational, and critical skills to be able to move through this world and discover more and more that is fascinating and overwhelming, that overwhelms them. Um, and in terms of what it does it mean to be an educated person, that's a different thing than what does it mean to educate people. The term comes from, uh, it works very nicely when there's an agreed upon canon, because then we know what, 100 great books, educated, boom, you know, that, that's easy. In a world where there are competing canons, where canons are playlists, it, the term educated person is much harder to define in terms of what she knows, much easier, not easy, but easier to define in terms of capabilities and attitudes. So. Yeah, that's, let's not put it to a vote, that's fine. But thank you very much. <laughs>